Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 10th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why we believe Bill Walker's campaign slogan should simply be, I'm from the rich, running to protect the rich. Second, we look at the most recent tax foundation study and find that it still doesn't address the question in an Alaska context of who pays for government. And third, we discuss the subtext directed toward the top 20% of those campaigning on increased K-12 spending. It's vote for me, I will increase K-12 through spending, and guess what? I won't make you pay for it. And now, let's join Michael. Brad, this morning, uh, we're going to start off with uh, your discussion on uh, um, the, the new campaign slogan. You you don't work for the Walker campaign, but you probably should uh, for, this, <laughs> for this new campaign slogan that you've come up with. Uh, and this is based off Bill Walker's piece in the Juno Empire, uh, or a piece about Bill Walker, rather, in the Juno Empire. Go ahead and tell us, what is the new campaign slogan that Bill Walker should be using? All right. So the so the 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 campaign slogan that came to me as I was reading through this article is Bill Walker. I'm from the rich, and I'm for the rich. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's where I'm from, and that's what I'm for. Um, Walker made a fortune uh, uh, suing the pipeline or suing the oil companies uh, over taxes uh, for years and years and years on behalf of the city of Valdez and other municipalities. And now he's using that fortune to protect the fortune and protect, uh, uh, protect the rich as well. The, the piece that the, the, the segment of the, of the empire article that, uh, or the empire interview with Mark Sabatini that, uh, that Bill did, that really got me, that really, you know, just got me, got me jettisoned into this is the following paragraph. Walker said his goal is to follow that approach, the POMV approach to achieve a total fund value of 100 billion to 120 billion, which will be sufficient to fund state government from earnings and pay fair dividends on a sustainable basis. Everybody loves right. that word sustainable. Sustainable, yeah. We keep using um, it. I'm not sure you know what it means. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, so the only, the, the way you get to the 100 and 120 billion, I've been dealing with this issue for the past year as it's really surfaced as more and more of, uh, a campaign mantra by various by various folks. Uh, the way you get to it is you cut PFDs now, uh, so that you don't have to you know call, you don't have to cut government spending or you don't have to you know uh, do taxes now. You cut PFDs uh, down to the level where you know sort of the government plus oil or the POMV plus oil takes care of government spending and whatever's left over goes to the PFD. And then once you get to this nirvana where you've got 100 to $120 billion that's going to fund government in perpetuity. We're not going to have to have, ta tax, have taxes. We're not going to be you know, at risk of, uh, of oil tax changes uh, or oil tax, uh, oil revenues or oil uh, uh, production. Once you get to this nirvana, you still have to cut PFDs <laughs> in, order, in order to pay for government. You essentially are taking that numbers calculated right. to get you about a, you know, a, a, a $5 billion to a uh, uh, five and a half billion dollar uh, revenue flow, and that's you know what what people think will will take care of UGF spending. We'll take care of we'll take care of government. So it's protect the rich now. Don't tax. Use PFD. Don't cut spending. Use PFD cuts now. Protect the rich. Don't have to don't have to get any contribution from the top twenty percent. 
when you get out to this nirvana of 100, 100 120 uh, billion, continue to protect the rich by continuing to cut the PFD so you can use all of that POMV revenue flow um, uh, to, uh, to, to support government. It is, it, I, I wrote a column, one of my columns for Landfield in the Alaska Landmine is titled The Yuppie Version of Fiscal Responsibility. That's, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's the yuppies who visualize themselves, the young urban professionals, who visualize themselves as on their way to the top 20%. If they haven't quite made it yet, they're on their way to the top 20%. They're going to be in the top 20% after, you know, after 2030 or 2032 or 2033 or somewhere, somewhere out in the 2030s, you know, you're going to, you're going to achieve your top 20% status. You really, you're willing to give up the PFD now to build up this, 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 this fund to build up the, the, the permanent fund to the point where you can get away without taxes once you're out there in the, you're in the, uh, in the 2030s uh, and you're in the top 20% and you don't want taxes. So it's, you know, for those who are already in the taxes now, those yuppies that are already in the, uh, in the top 20% now, it's great. They don't pay taxes now. They don't pay taxes in the future. They just sort of get a free ride, a free government on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Right. For those that, even for those that aren't there yet. And I've, you know, I've encountered some and say, well, that, wouldn't the, doesn't cutting the PFD cost you more than, than taxes would now? Yeah, but I'm going to be in the top 20%. So they, they view it sort of as a retirement fund, if you will, sort of as a, a, a mid-career subsidy uh, for, for them once they, get, uh, once, once they get into the top 20% and then, uh, and then beyond that. And Walker has bought into it hook, line, and sinker. Uh, he's using that as the center point uh, for his campaign. So basically what he's saying, I'm from the rich. I, Bill Walker, understand this because I'm rich. And, 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 and I'm for the rich. I'm for the rich now because you guys don't have to pay taxes. Elect me. You don't have to pay taxes. We still get government. We still get all these, these goods and services that, you, that you've come to rely on. And some of you contract for. You get all these goods and services. Don't have to pay for it. We'll shove that on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. And I'm going to protect you out in the future. All you younger ones that are on your way, I'm going to protect you out in the future uh, by uh, by continuing to uh, to go down this road and use PFD cuts to fund government. Essentially, use PFD cuts to fund government in the future as well. It's I I, I can't I can't begin to ex explain the frustration level I have when I hear you know young people talking about that, younger younger professionals talking about that. I mean, they don't. I don't think they understand. I think they see it as a nirvana, right? As right. Alaska, Alaska is going to be this great state where I, you know, the oh, ideal of the nation. It's all self-sustaining. It's all, we wouldn't have to do anything. We don't have to pay any taxes. We don't have to do, it'll all just be this utopian glorified, you know, whatever. What really struck me, Brad, about this whole article in the Juno Empire, by the way, which I'll post in the chat room, but is this whole, this whole tone of the article where, you know, oh, I'm the martyr. So I threw myself on the permanent fund grenade and all this kind of stuff. And then the revisionist history that uh, that Sabatini writes into this when, you know, Bill Walker said, well, I did this. And when I explained to people why I did it, they're like, oh, wow, you did why you did it the right way. And then he goes on to say what the former Republican did as an independent governor from 2014 to 2018 was to lead the effort during the last year of his term to fund government by drawing money out of the permanent fund for the first time in its 40 year history. The plan to opposition, yada, yada, yada. But that's that's not just what he did. If he had only just drawn money out of the earnings reserve, which was always allowable, it was always allowable to have money come out of the earnings reserve. But instead, he cut Alaskans dividends and left that money in the earnings reserve account while drawing money. So it's all disingenuous. It's all revisionist history. Oh, woe is me. Look at me. I took one for the team. That's why you should, because I'm the one that can get the. It's it's all Bert Stedman. The whole thing is just nothing but a big load of steaming stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, Walker does have this. Walker does have this self self picture of himself that he was the. And, and you know, after after he was unelected, after after Dunleavy defeated him, Walker went out to to Harvard and taught a course on independence and you know and political independence and how they make their way in the world and they can take the hard stands because they're not beholden to either side. And I did that in the last. Bill's just Bill's built a picture of himself that is great for his top twenty percent, his top five percent, his top one percent uh, 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 support group, 
Um, I mean, it's it's a wonderful picture for them. Look at what we did. We we, we pulled off the, the coup of the century. We didn't have to pay a dime. We get to continue government spending. And we pulled it all off the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. But that's that's his self-image. That's his self-picture. And that's, you know, that's how he portrays himself. That's how he portrayed himself at Harvard. That's why you have all that outside money that's supporting the Walker campaign, because he's the true independent. He's the one that, you know, that stood up against the winds of the of the political parties and forced, you know, forced responsibility down the throat of Alaskans. He didn't force responsibility down the throat of Alaskans. He took money from middle and lower income Alaska taxpayers, from kids, um, and, and used it to support government spending to avoid touching the top 20%. That's what he did. And, and for him to paint a picture, you know, a champion on the white horse, um, he's a champion on the white horse for the rich. I'm from the rich. I'm for the rich. Uh, yeah. But but for it, for 80 percent of Alaska families, for the overall Alaska economy, he did exactly the wrong thing. And, yeah. and you know, he just refuses to stand up and say, well, you know, there could have been some downside of this. It's just, yeah. you know, keep on driving through. Well, and as a side note, I noticed that that uh, Dragas got into the got into the discussion at one point where they're talking about trying to bolster Alaska's economy and and making the workforce work better. And then the, she said, "Well, you know, we've got to fix some systemic problems if you want to build a workforce, and you've got to tackle affordable housing, which of course is code for we're going to provide more government housing." Which uh, you know, uh, the whole thing just I just look at this and my eyes cross when I think about this. It's it's insane. Final thoughts here on number one bill walker's brand new campaign slogan well i it, it it's just it's just a repetition walker is the candidate of the rich let's face up to that he's the candidate of kathy giesel he's the candidate candidate of 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 all of the keep a Ala keep alaska competitive crew i mean right. he's he's the candidate of the rich and for middle and for any middle and lower income alaska families concerned about themselves concerned about their kids concerned about alaska's economic future, private economic future, you're going down the wrong road uh, if you uh, if you follow Bill Walker, because all he's going to do is he's going to keep feeding you this line and keep taking your money to, right. to, to make sure the top 20 percent don't have to contribute. All right, let's go on to number two, the big question of who pays, um, who pays, and it appears that the Tax Foundation is uh, dodging this question. Uh, they put out a tweet with a big uh, with a big article about the economic implications of the Alaska income tax or its alternatives and yada, yada, yada. Give us your thoughts on this right now. Well, Alaska, uh, the, the tax foundation comes at Alaska about once a year and they come up with a big study. I don't know if that's Alaska Policy Forum that's behind that or or Alaska, uh, uh, the, the Coke founder, the Coke, uh, affiliate here in Alaska that puts them up to it. But Tax Foundation, which is a fairly conservative national organization, comes up once a year with a, with a study uh, on Alaska. Last year, it was focused sort of the same way, a little bit different words, a little bit shorter, uh, but sort of the same way, which was, is basically tax uh, if you have to. You shouldn't really do it, but tax if you have to. And if you're going to tax, do a sales tax. Don't do uh, an income tax. And when they talk about income tax, they talk about a progressive income tax. I want to get into a little bit of the nuance of that after we do the break, but 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 they mostly talk about an income tax. The analysis that they do um, is mostly uh, about an income tax. There's no mention. There, there's one use of the word permanent fund dividend uh, in the entire piece, fairly long piece. One use of the permanent fund dividend, but that's not even in the context of of you know the fact we're using the 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 the, the fiscal tool the revenue tool right. with the largest adverse impact on the overall economy no analysis of who pays no analysis of who's paying now middle and lower income alaska families no analysis of who would pay under a sales tax middle and lower income alaska families largely um, and and really no analysis of who pays under the income tax they propose they just sort of skip over the whole who pays question and just say we really need if you're going to do a tax we really need a sales tax to make sure basically the top 20% are protected. So it's uh, it, it's it, it, it's interesting reading for somebody that does this work uh, 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 on a regular basis, uh, interesting analysis, but it has no relevance to Alaska because it doesn't talk about the permanent fund dividend and the, and the adverse impact that's having and talk about alternatives to the permanent fund dividend. And because it doesn't analyze who pays under the uh, under the approaches that, uh, that, that they're proposing. 
Well, and, and it, I think that's the the one thing that's missed. I mean, that's one thing that you can go back and say that ICER has hit on repeatedly is the adverse economic impact of the taking of the permanent fund, that it is the largest, it has the largest adverse impact on the Alaskan economy and families directly, um, that it is a tax, that it is taking, and as you pointed out, from children, from children and families, and especially those who can least afford it, and people should be up in arms about it. And, and either they're not or we're just not seeing the the proper reporting on what people are thinking about this. well part of it part of it michael is it's studies like this that just look past it i mean this is the perfect study economic implications of an alaska income tax are its alternatives well one of the alternatives and the alternative we happen to be using is permanent fund dividend cuts pfd cuts that's the revenue alternative we're using that has the largest adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. If you're going to analyze Alaska revenue alternatives, and maybe part of the problem here is this is a DC group uh, as opposed to an Alaska group, but if you're going to al analyze Alaska revenue alternatives, you've got to look at the one we're using now, which is, which is PFD cuts, taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families, and start from there. When we get studies like this that don't even mention the PFD, don't analyze the impact of the PFD, don't look at who's paying Alaska's revenue now, then the press, who doesn't dive into this deeply, the press just sort of overlooks that, overlooks the PFD. Oh, well, you know, we're, we're talking about a debate here between an income tax and a sales tax. So that's what we got to write our story about. It completely, you know, it just, it, it sends everybody off spinning in a direction that's not very, not realistic and not very right. productive because that's not the reality we're dealing with right now. Yeah, absolutely. We we look at this and and that's what kills me is that nobody is addressing the fact that this has I mean, and you and I have been hitting on this since 2014 that any taking of the permanent fund is as the largest of all the levers that they could pull as governments as leaders as as legislators, all the levers that they could pull to help fund or fix shortfalls or revenues or anything else the one lever that has the largest adverse impact and the most impact on the economy, one, and two on Alaska families is the taking of the permanent fund. And they all go, oh, yeah. I mean, I remember in 2014, we were asking the question of candidates. We were asking the question, do you support ICER's approach of a sustainable budget that we should be no more than $4.1 billion dollars? Uh, in spend, and that we should be avoiding taking the permanent fund because it has, oh, yes, they all said, yes, 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 we all believe in that, we all believe, and the next thing you know, it's 4.5, 4.6, 4.7 billion dollars, and they're taking the permanent fund. Nobody's talking about what has the largest impact on the economy and people. It's all about, well, government spend's got to be protected. Don't you, why do you hate children? Why do you hate roads? Why do you hate people being safe and being able to read? I mean, that's kind of the, the answer. Here's, here's my theory on that, Michael. The, the, the two biggest studies, and frankly, the last major studies on the issue were in 2016 and 2017. 2016 is the ICER study. 2017 is the, is the ITEP study, uh, Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. Those were, the, those were the two big studies. They got a lot of press at the time, but there's not been any big studies since um, uh, on the issue. And so there's nothing new for the press to latch onto and, and to talk about and to ask candidates about. You have to go back to the 2016 and the 2017 studies, which are still valid. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the same economic drivers now than as they were then. Uh, they, haven't changed, they haven't changed at all. They're sort of, they're sort of universal, um, but there's no new study to come out. Now, why isn't there a new study? That's because government hasn't commissioned a new study. The 2016 study was done at the request of the administration, then Bill, then Governor Bill Walker's administration, who then ignored it, but it was done at the, at the request of the administration, paid for by the administration, and the 2017 study was done uh, at the request of the legislature when the legislature was considering very various fiscal os options. The the Niels Andreasen, when he was at the Institute of the North, sort of continued on by having the guy who did the 2017 ITEP study talk at various forums and continued to keep the, the issue alive and, and, and sort of renewed that issue uh, along the way. But now Nils is over at the Alaska Municipal League and guess what? <laughs> They're not talking about it uh, much anymore. Right. 
uh, because it's not doesn't serve their interests. They want to take just like every every other government body, they want to take that easy money out of the permanent fund dividend. Easy because the legislature can just do it without the governor getting involved. They just want to take that easy money out of the permanent fund dividend um, and use it for local government as well, but through grants from the state government down to local government. So we haven't had. It's been you and me and and, and others and some candidates certainly Mike Shower and others. But but we haven't had the study, the study that that you know the press can latch on to and report. Instead, instead, we've gotten these series of studies like from the Tax Foundation, which says, oh, the issue is really between sales tax and income tax. And you know, we the issue isn't isn't anywhere near between the sales tax and the income tax. We've got the permanent fund dividend tax that uh, that 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 is staring us in the face and affecting us every day. So you got these studies that are either irrelevant. Um, they're focused on things that are that that aren't happening, or uh, you've got studies that, uh, uh, or or, you, or you've got agencies that just aren't pursuing those studies anymore. So there there isn't anything new for the for the press to latch onto. When you have Mark Sabatini from the Juno Empire, when you have Iris Samuels, you know, when you trade out these reporters and you get new local reporters reporting on the thing, they don't have any history with these issues. Nat Nat Hertz, who wrote the 2017 article on the on the ITEP report did sort of still raise that issue along the way when he was still writing for the ADN. But now that he's gone freelance, you don't get any of that stuff out of the ADN because they're new reporters there and there isn't anything new from them to la- for them to latch on to. So I, that's my theory on, on why there's been radio silence about this issue. It's because it's because they don't have a document from government or from a government sponsored uh, study uh, uh, that, uh, that that's really analyzing uh, the issue. Anymore. Right. Right. Donna drops one in the chat room, her bomb for the day. Here's a study. Government spending is a drain in the economy. Private spending rolls through the economy and creates jobs and economic growth. This is just an argument that we've had for many years about the number of times money rolls in an economy versus public versus private. We've got to get that money into the private economy. That's where creation happens, not consumption. Right. I mean, that's uh, all yeah. right. I'll let you I'll comment come on that. I'll let you comment on that and start with that on the other side. OK. All right. All right, we're continuing with Brad Keithley. Uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we were just talking here in the chat room about uh, monies and running in the economy. And Donna Ardwin, who happens to be listening to the show, dropped a, a, a gem in the chat room that said, here's a study. Government spending is a drain on the economy. Private spending rolls through the economy and creates jobs and economic growth. And Brad, this is what I've been saying for years. It's pretty obvious to anybody who's really paying attention. Government is a net consumer, not a producer. The private sector is the production side. That's what, I mean, the, all government does is really consume. Uh, they may have some short-term production and creating things like, you know, infrastructure and things, but those are all very short-term. The only way you get long-term continuous production of wealth is from the private economy. And this goes right back to that, the whole idea of the number of times a dollar turns in the public versus the private economy. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with that. I mean, I, I think that's correct. We were talking about, in the context of that, we were talking about studies and the lack of studies comparing the the, the cuts in the permanent fund dividend to other uh, revenue options and the impact of, of cuts in the permanent fin- fund dividend compared to those compared to those other revenue options. And and there was one, I mean, there was a study that did exactly, pointed out exactly what Donna just pointed out, that she helped sponsor during the beginning of the Dunleavy administration. It was from the Battelle Institute in Ohio. But even that study <laughs> got drawn into the de- debate between sales taxes and income taxes and spent and spent a lot of its time it didn't just focus in on that on that one issue about government being a drain. It got focused on well, if government's going to be a drain, if government needs revenue, right? Uh, where does that revenue come from? And then it focused on the sales tax versus income tax, and sort of sort of went down went down that road. So even even the studies uh, that that you know try to make that point get drawn into the debate about who pays, and get drawn don't don't get drawn into the debate about how you know we ought to fund this this uh, uh, this whole, but don't do a study that includes the permanent fund dividend cut. So you don't see all the revenue options uh, at once in one study. You're just seeing little slices that people want to advocate for, like Tax Foundation does with sales taxes here. Little slices, little slices of studies that sort of you know focus on what they want to advocate for. If we're going to have revenues, it ought to be a sales tax, not an income tax. Here, here's the here's the one other thing I want to say about the Tax Foundation study. What's intriguing to me is that the ta- tax foundation has been a big advocate of going to a flat tax. 
And part of the report, part of, of, of Jared's report in the Tax Foundation study is to talk about the number of states that have been converting from a progressive income tax to a flat tax. Um, and, and, there, and it truly is a wave uh, among, among conservative uh, governments, uh, Republican uh, governments, to be converting their previously progressive income taxes to a, to a flat tax. And Jared talks about that being a good thing, and it is a good thing because it, it doesn't, you know, PFDs are bad because they push cost to middle and lower income Alaska families. Progressive income taxes are bad because they push disproportionate cost to top 20%. Top, the flat tax takes, an, it takes a proportionate amount from everybody across the board. Everybody has the same uh, stake in the game. So Tax Foundation has been a big advocate of that. Tax Foundation talks about it uh, in this, but they don't talk about it in an Alaska context. They talk about it as in, in this context. They say, well, progressive income taxes are bad. Even, you know, even states that still have un income taxes uh, 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 agree with that. They're going to a flat tax. But much, what's, what's even better than that is a sales tax. And they don't stick on flat tax and talk about flat, and he doesn't stick on flat tax and talk about flat tax as an alternative uh, for Alaska, as we've talked about for a long time. So th there's... There, there's almost, you know, as I was reading through it, I was going, okay, okay, okay. Where'd it go? <laughs> we had ball. Yeah, ball went right by, you swung and you missed. That was it right there. We had, we had a flat tax. We have a flat tax. They're good things. Arizona's adopting it. Oklahoma's looking at everybody's, everybody's moving toward a flat tax. It's great. It's great. And then it disappears from the page. We go on to, you know, how bad, how much better sales taxes are. So I, you know, it, until we get a study that goes back to the basics and looks at the fact that Alaskans today are paying for government through a PFD tax, a tax on their PFD that's shoving most of the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families, until we have a study that starts at that reality and then builds from there, we're just going to we're going to continue to go through the cycle of sort of meaningless, useless. Oh, that's interesting. Right. Fun to read. You know, put that on the shelf. I mean. We're we're not, and, and, and the press is going to go through cycles of. Oh, we're not talking about yeah, sales right. taxes, right? What exactly I mean, are we talking about here, right? right. Exactly. And, until we get somebody that focuses on the PFD, starts the conversation at what the reality is on the ground today, um, we're not going to have a study that's that's going to be you know worth a lot or get give a lot of get a lot of attention or be worth uh, uh, talking about for long periods of time on the show. Let's move on to number three. I really want to get onto this, which is the new battle cry of all the campaigns that are business as usual, the Republicans, the Democrats, the business as usual Republicans. Well, what I should say is the pro-government people versus the pro-private sector people, isn't it? And the, and the battle cry has become education and the BSA and don't you care about the children? And I, 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 our, I believe our schools are worth fighting for. That's Zach Fields' newest piece, and another opinion about uh, another opinion about uh, benefits and 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 uh, and pensions. And this is the new battle cry. It is. It is. If you look across the campaigns, I I hadn't done this analysis until this past week, but if you look across the campaigns, there are a huge number of teachers uh, running for office up in Fairbanks, down in Sitka. In Anchorage, I mean, there's a huge number of teachers uh, or people who are prioritizing education in their campaign pitches that are running for a office, and and it's and and we're beginning to see. You remember back in in 2014 when Sean Parnell was running for governor, and all we saw were ADN articles or Alaska. Yeah, it was ADN at the time. Um, Alaska Dispatch articles about uh, the National Guard uh, crisis and you know what's the right. governor doing about the National Guard right. crisis. Well, all of a sudden we're seeing all these stories about about the $60 million shortfall in uh, the Alaska school district and, you know, about all these teachers who are leaving the state because we don't have a defined benefits program. We don't have a, we don't have a pension program for teachers. And that's building, if you watch it, if you, if you, if you start looking at it from that angle, that's building up to be the big campaign issue as we go into the last two or three weeks uh, of this campaign. And Zach Field's opinion piece from yesterday in the ADN it's sort of the poster child for that, right? I mean, you, I, I, I had snippets of it that we were going to talk about um, uh, that had built up over the past week. But Zach Fields has sort of brought it all together and just sort of plop. Um, and basically what Zach is saying, you want to you want to close that $60 million deficit without having to increase uh, property taxes or without having to close your kid's school or without having to end sports programs or ban programs or, 
you know, just go down through the list. If you want to close that $60 million uh, deficit, what you need to do is elect Democrats or independents who are, who are, who are Democrats in disguise, because they're going to go to Juno and they're going to increase the BSA. And by the way, that's what this other op-ed does. By the way, why they're there and why they're worrying about education, let's just go ahead and give defined benefits to teachers also. That'll be a little add-on as it, as, right. as it comes through committee. So what, what we're seeing is this buildup, just like the, the Sean Parnell National Guard issue in 2014, what we're seeing is this buildup of stories about the school district and this buildup of stories about teacher pensions and, and you know, the, the, the critical role that teacher pensions pay, pay, play in, in retaining teachers uh, in Alaska. We're seeing the buildup of these, of these stories as we approach the election. And then you're seeing candidates, if you follow on Twitter or you just follow their comments in the newspaper or just listen to their stock speech, then we see the candidates going, and we've got to do something about the about the anchorage shortfall or else Johnny's school's going to get closed and his band program's going to get shut down and 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 Julie's uh, 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 sports program is going to be cut. We're going to cut women's programs first and uh, Julie's sports program is going to be cut. And 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 you don't want that. Your property right. taxes are going to go up. So let's do this. Let's elect me, uh, the good old solid independent candidate. Let's elect me and I'll go down to Juno. And by gosh, we'll increase the BSA and we'll, you know, we'll protect Johnny's school. We'll protect your little Julie's right. program. Right. And that's, and that's where we're going on this. Yeah, no, I agree. That's because we've seen that from some of the candidates on this very program talk specifically about that. Almost every democratic candidate that we've had and a few of the independents and a few of the business as usual Republicans have all said, well, we've got to really look at this BSA. We've got to increase this because, you know, education, they haven't been funding education. They haven't been funding. You would think that they have been taking all the dollars from it. They haven't been funding education. Now, they never talk about the fact that while the BSA has not been adjusted since 2017, 2016, 2017, there has been exponential amounts of money, gobs of money that have been poured down on top of the BSA that has has to do with mismanagement they don't talk about the overall declining enrollment it's oh man we're out of time i just looked at the clock and all right brad i'm gonna rant for a second this is insane i mean again they treat it that's exactly what they say well you know the bsa hasn't been adjusted since 2016 and so we're underfunding the schools the billions of dollars you put the bsa is the starting point you have poured billions of dollars into the school system since 2016, and you have, again, they don't talk about the declining enrollment rates, that enrollment rates are going down, and that they, the budgets are going up. They sh they're not talking about those inverse, uh, uh, you know, uh, graphs at all. And, and they're like, well, no, we should get more, but you have less students. But we should get more because we're not getting the achievements that we need. The, you have less students and more money now. How is that going to fix it? You know what the real irony is about this, Michael? The real irony is that pitch, the, you know, education's underfunded. We're having low performing students. We're going to have to close schools. We're not going to be able to construct new ones. That pitch is really focused a lot on the top 20%. It's really focused a lot on families that, that are in businesses or run businesses that are dependent upon the education system to produce qualified graduates to continue to run those businesses or or families that, you know, really focus on uh, uh, school for their kids. All families do, but the top 20% think they focus on it a lot more than anybody else. And here's the subtle, here's the subtlety of it. And we can do it all with PFD cuts. <laughs> so, so you don't have to pay for it. So vote for us. We'll spend more on the things that you think are important and on the things that make, you know, make your business run better. The things that you tell the pulsers are important to having a good, a good business, um, uh, 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 condition here in Alaska, vote for us. We'll do that. And you won't have to pay for it because we're going to do it through PFD cuts. It is horrible. It is horrible. Right. Zach, Zach Fields is the worst at that. Zach Fields is, is the, is the quintessential limousine liberal in, in, in Alaska. Give me all this government, give me all this spending, but don't make me pay for it. Right. I, I right. mean, my gosh, I, my wife and I have a $250,000 income. I don't want to pay any of that for it. Right. Uh, let's just use PFD cuts for it. Right. And it's and and, and the disconnect, the disconnect uh, between between the pitch of spend more, spend more, spend more, and but you don't have to pay for it. It's just I I just it, it drives. That's what drives me over the wall. That's what drives me to rant. Yeah. No. I mean, and again, we're seeing more and more of this. I like I said, with every candidate 
that was an independent or a, a business as usual pro government spend, uh, you know, Democrat or Republican. It all was about how we need it. We've got to adjust this BSA. Our, ki our kids need it. Our kids need this. And then, oh, yeah, by the way, we also needed to find benefits program because, you know, they're just not taken care of well enough, um, which, again, it, it just it, it's a disaster in the making. But unfortunately, like you said, some people just, oh, it's for the children. Oh, well, we better take care of it then. Oh, we be some of the verbiage that Zach used in this piece, though. Oh, just it just infuriated me. Um, what did he said? Uh, uh, how did he put it? Um, the, the, uh, the talking about, um, I actually highlighted it. Where is it? Uh, the malicious campaigns against school bonds. He said, Oh, the malicious campaigns against school bonds, you know, because what property owners are tired of being taken to the trough and drowned yet again, because they're not going to take their licks like you normally. Oh, which, you know, what do you care? It's only a few bucks per $100,000 of your house. So you should just do it. The malicious camp. People are tired. That's not a malicious campaign. People are frustrated and tired with this. And they're seeing that the system is, I mean, they may not be able to uh, to explain it, but they know in their hearts that the system is fundamentally broken. Something's wrong. And that's why they do it. It's not a malicious campaign. It's that people don't want to pay for it anymore. And here's Zach's, here's, here's the subtlety of Zach's pitch. Vote for me, vote for Democrats, and we'll take care of it because we'll use PFD cuts to pay for it. We'll, we'll do all these great things. We'll increase the BSA. We'll increase, you know, spending on schools. We'll increase the, 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 or we'll go back to the, to the standard on, uh, on uh, reimbursement of uh, school bonds. Uh, vote for me and we'll do all that. And you won't have to pay for it. Right. And that's just, I, that's, that's the part that drives me over the edge. I mean, that the unfairness, the 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 inequity, the 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 hurt to the Alaska economy uh, of of that pitch. And then you know, you, you talk about business as usual. Republicans, well, yeah, yeah, we we can't oppose education. We can't oppose, but but we don't have to pay for it, right? I mean, we we can use PFD cuts for it, right? So right. so it's okay. I can say I can say I'm supporting education. Then I can say I'm supporting an increase in the BSA as long as I don't have to pay for it. Oh, God, it's just so painful to watch. Um, somebody said something earlier in the chat room about uh, how is it so obvious to most of us? And there's a, just a few that continue to. Uh, here it goes. This is Herder. It never ceases to astound how what appears is so completely self-evident is so elusive to some minds. And I don't know if it's elusive or just the disingenuousness of, you know, we're just going to tell we're going to say the quiet part out loud. And, and you're going to just, it, it blows my mind, Brad, just blows my mind. Final thoughts before I let you go here. Well, that's just, I mean, that's how, that's how they built government. I mean, going back to Bill Walker, that's how Bill Walker built government. Uh, you know, I'm going to build, I'm going to continue to fund government. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to continue to fight for, for education, for the university and all that, but you don't have to pay for it. Yeah. I mean, to, the, yeah. to the top. It, it, that's, that's the whole thing that's going on. And the look at me. Pitch that's going on. And look at me. I jumped on the grenade for you. I did it for you. I did it for you. I'm not looking for anything except for another term. I did it for you. Feel for me. Yeah. Yeah. Keep Alaska competitive, folks. I did it for you. I didn't. I didn't raise it. I didn't raise all taxes. You didn't want me to raise all taxes. I didn't raise taxes on you. Exactly. You it's millionaires. All, yeah. It's all about all I, about us. I made them. I, I made. I made them. Get this. I made. I made middle and lower income Alaska families pay for yeah. all of it. Ah! Don't it's just it, and and Zach's right in there. So it's I mean that's what we're hearing. Got to spend on the schools. Got to spend to, to retain teachers. But you don't have to pay for it. I love it. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Thank you, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube. SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.